Welcome to the Life's Best Medicine Podcast, where we are finding hope and healing one episode at a time. No appointment needed, no rubber gloves, and no coping. Just a healthy dose of life lessons to help equip you for this wild journey we call life. Hey everyone, this is a friendly reminder that we are here for entertainment purposes only. We may not even be that entertaining at times, but this is not medical advice. You know, talk to your doctor, check with your healthcare professionals uh, before making any lifestyle changes or, you know, medicine changes. What we're talking about is our clinical experience and what we've seen. And so if you really want our advice, you can consult us. You can actually consult me as a doctor, or you can consult my guest and, uh, and get all your questions answered. But we can't give free medical advice because we can't pay our bills with that. But we can help to educate you a bit and allow you to think a little bit. And always reach out to your medical professional before making any lifestyle changes. Thank you. Again, I want to thank my sponsors, Keto Mojo, keto-mojo.com. Great website, great people. They're doing great work in the community. They're doing a ton of with education. So if you're looking for a ketone monitor or a, a glucose monitor, they're a great, great resource. And check out their website. It's amazing. They have so much information, so much good stuff for us to all learn from. Also, of course, health code, gethealth.com, G-E-T-H-L-T-H.com. Uh, discount code METHEALTH through through this podcast and for, for metabolic health. Uh, they still have great chocolate and vanilla shakes and uh, vegetarian offerings uh, for those so inclined. Um, but they're doing great work. And they also have a new berberine that a lot of people are, are raving about that has turmeric in it. So uh, it's right up, you know, what, what we're looking for for our patients for improving metabolic health. So uh, again, thank you for your sponsorship and for bringing these episodes. And uh, thank you for listening. Hello, and welcome back to the Life's Best Medicine podcast. You know, a lot of you know I do volunteer work in Central America, Vietnam, different places like that. And, you know, I've always been in awe of these guys. So, uh, Rayanne Newquist, welcome. The Mercy Ship, you guys, you do such amazing stuff. I, I see the videos and it's so inspiring. And, hmm. and uh, so tell people who don't know about the Mercy Ship what it's all about and how you got involved in this. Yeah, absolutely. It is. It is pretty incredible. Um, it's an amazing organization to get to be a part of. But we have the world's largest non-governmental hospital ships. And we go and perform free, life-changing, and in many cases, life-saving surgeries for impoverished people in sub-Saharan Africa. So for example, right now, we have one ship in Madagascar. We have another ship in Sierra Leone. And we perform as many surgeries as we possibly can during about a 10 month period that we are in port in these developing nations. We have about six areas of specialty that we focus on in our surgical rotations. We um, do a max fax rotation where we have patients with large maxillofacial tumors that are benign, um, but those tumors can grow on their face and neck um, to such a size that it can suffocate them and they become lethal. So we remove those things that you don't see in the West, you know, really, if we had a small bump on our face, we would just go see you or we'd go see a doctor, you know, and have it removed. But without having access to medical care or safe surgery, um, these people will have these conditions that grow and become deadly. So we do a max fax rotation and we do orthopedics. Um, for children that have windswept legs or severe bowed legs, um, we do that rotation for them. We do a plastics rotation for burn contractures, something we see a lot in the developing world is people cook over open fires and there's lots of open fires and it, unfortunately accidents happen and people are burned severely. And then when those burns heal, if they're not treated medically, um, you know, in a timely way, they cause severe contractures and people lose the mobility of their hands and arms and so forth. So we will release those contractures and then go through a series of physical therapy to strengthen um, those limbs and get people back on their feet again. We do cataract removal, cleft lip and palate repair, and then we do a women's health rotation where we repair fistula for women who have um, 
been in prolonged labor, usually losing their babies and then delivering with a body that is kind of torn apart a little bit. Usually there's a hole in their bladder and they're leaking urine. So we go in and um, repair that as well. Wow. So do you do these on separate trips? Or... No. So no. we will pull into port for 10 months and our medical staff will have a whole um, surgery schedule mapped out for those 10 months. And we will go through each one of these areas and have surgeons who will fly in from all over the world and maybe just be there for two weeks and focus on their area of expertise and, you know, knock out as many surgeries as they can during that time. So we do, we go through all the rotations. I would, I mean, for the most part in each field service. And the surgeries are actually done on the ship. Yes. So you have sterile environment because there, there's a lot of places I've been. I look and like, okay, I don't right. think I want to get surgery here, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, and that's actually a big part of what we do. So on our both on board both of our vessels, um, we have state of the art hospitals and with, you know, five to six operating theaters on board, everything is, yes, very sterile, very safe. Um, and one thing that we do is our education training and advocacy within the developing nations where we serve. So not only do we bring patients on board to receive surgery, but we go out into the community. And if there is any kind of healthcare system, we want to bolster that. So we do a lot of education and training specifically in what you just mentioned in safe surgery and sterilization, um, things that, you know, there might be, I, I actually spoke to one gentleman and he was looking for surgery. Um, he had, a, I think, a tumor. And he there was a local hospital that he could go to, but the power was not reliable. And so he could be on the operating you know, bed and be cut open and, this, and the power goes out. Well, how in the world is that safe? Like, can you imagine? <laughs> right? So anyways, um, you know, there, some, in some of these countries, there is medical services offered. Oftentimes they're so expensive that people could never afford them. But even if they can, a lot in a lot of cases, they're not really safe surgery. So we like to do a lot of education. We have simulators on board one of our ships and we will bring local doctors or surgeons on board and train them in our simulators and allow them to, you know, really gain the knowledge and understanding and um, the skills to be able to do these surgeries to their, for their own people. Our, our oh, desire really is to work ourselves out of a job, right? <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. That's kind of how I look at my job too. It's like, if we get people healthy, they don't need us anymore, but yeah. you know, and they're not going to be, you know, it helps the healthcare system, right? If sure. people are healthier, like if everyone's sick, it's not very good if you have a shortage of docs. Right. And so it's right. amazing. So these docs will fly down, join the team down there for a couple of weeks, do their thing, go back to work. Yeah. So it's not like a 10 month commitment. Cause I was thinking, man, it's hard to get, you know, I usually do, you know, you know, 20, you know, 15 or 20 days when I go down, but you yeah. go, if I had to be down another 10 months, you can't, you lose your office. Basically, right, right. Right. Yeah. No. So we have a lot of our doctors do just come in for a rotation. It might be two weeks. Um, but we find that if our doctors aren't recur, aren't, you know, returning year after year, some of them just stay. And we've had a lot of doctors who have left their practices eventually in their home countries and they just stay on board and they'll come for months and months at a time. We actually have one of our head surgeons has been there for over 30 years, just kind of couldn't leave. Um, but yeah, most, yeah. most, most of our doctors will come in for about, you know, two to four weeks, depending on their area of expertise. Yeah, I would imagine as they get older and they get close to retirement, they go, hey, I don't want to really retire. I just want to deal with the hassles of insurance companies and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah. And then they could come down and practice for six months or a year, you know, yeah. and, and just, you know, help a lot of people. Absolutely. Yeah. It's amazing because I've seen it. And I'll tell you one story because you'll appreciate this. I was in... Uh, I was in El Salvador actually. And, you know, we we're talking to the people getting our meds together. Cause I, I'm just doing internal medicine stuff. And, uh, one of the ladies there said, doctor, I'm, I'm embarrassed to ask you, but our, our worship leader here, he has, uh, he's going blind. He went blind in his right eye. He's mm -hmm. going to go blind in his other eye. He has a tumor. And, and she goes, can you just look at his stuff? And, and, and so I'm looking at his stuff kind of helpless. Cause I'm in, I can't give him medicines to fix it. It's a surgical problem. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we had been there for 15 days or so at this point. Anyways, uh, I'm looking, I talked to my, the other doctor I'm working with, I go, we have friends who are ENTs, maybe we can fly someone. Then we're thinking about operating time. Can we bring them to Mexico? You can't get them from El Salvador to Mexico because of, you know, yeah, <laughs> immigration issues and all that kind of stuff. It's like, oh gosh. 
so anyway, we were thinking about it, and I I stuck the 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 kid stuff in my back pocket. We were going down for our clinic. It was seven in the morning, and there was a lady on the elevator with me, and she mm-hmm. said, "Oh," and, she, and I was in scrubs, and she said, "Oh, you're the other medical team here." And I said, "You're a medical team? Yeah. What do you do? Ears, nose, and throat surgeries." I said, oh, "You got to be kidding me!" I said, "Have you ever seen this?" And I handed her the paperwork. And she's wow. like, oh my gosh, yes, we're coming back. We have a team coming in three weeks. They could do this surgery. No. This is a bread and butter because we this kid was going to go blind, you know? Oh my god. And uh, I get off the elevator. The lady that had given me the paperwork the day before, I go, here, here's Dr. So-and-so, meet so-and-so, like, let's set up this surgery. And it was just amazing to be able to connect people. But yes. from, from what you're doing is bringing in people that can meet this need. And I've seen stuff with cle- cleft palates and mm-hmm. – whatever needs to be done. It's, it's life-changing for these, for these kids and adults that have Absolutely. Been, their whole life have been outcast. And, mm-hmm. and I don't know if it's like that in Africa, but in some places, if you have certain conditions, people think you're cursed or they think yeah. there's something wrong with you and you get, you get, uh, you know, blackballed from society basically. Sure. Oh, absolutely. We say that all the time. In fact, you know, when we talk about our little tagline, if you will, is that we bring hope and healing to the world's forgotten poor. And, you know, a lot of the healing comes through the, the safe free surgery that we perform, but also it comes through just looking people in the eye and saying, you matter and you're a value. And it's something that they haven't heard because it's very similar in, in Africa. You know, I think a lack of education in some of these developing nations cause people to believe that you're contagious. If I am around you, I will get a cleft lip or I will get, you know, a tumor and you're cursed and you're total outcast. You know, these people will spend their lives in the shadows hiding, but when they come on board, they're, they're touched, you know, they're given a hug, their hands are held, they're looked in the eye. And I feel like their hope and their healing begins long before they ever get into an operating theater. Yeah. That's such, that's the the most important part of it too, is that they feel loved and cared for and that someone's, you know, for them, they think you're coming all the way or halfway around the world to help me, you know, and it's so humbling and it's so amazing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how did you get involved? Like what, 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 what called you to, you know, get into to this realm? Like, what were you doing before and how did you get exposed to it or, or know anything about it? Well, I'm not a doctor and I'm not medical whatsoever. So um, I'll just say that, you know, a lot of people think because we're hospital ships that everyone has to be a medical professional that comes on board. But really, when you think about a ship, we're a floating city. So we have all of our maritime crew. We've got a captain and the engineers on board, but we also have housekeepers. We have um, people that work in the dining room and the galley to prepare all the food. There's an HR department on board. There's a communications department on board with photographers and videographers. I mean, you name it. It's a whole city, even baristas. Um, but we, as a family, um, my husband was a first responder. He was working in law enforcement and was kind of coming to the point of being able to retire and kind of thinking, what is life going to look like in retirement? You know, prior to going into law enforcement, he was a pastor at a church, which is where we met and really just felt like God was calling him back into full-time ministry, but didn't really want to go back into church ministry per se. So we had never heard of Mercy Ships until a couple of years previously. We were supporting a friend of ours who was um, going to be a kindergarten teacher on board. So all of our crew on board, they're volunteers. So we actually pay to go. Um, And a lot of our crew who go long term, they will raise their support. They'll find people that will donate and contribute financially so that they can be there. And because families come and serve on board the ships, we have fully accredited academies on board. And there's teachers from all over the world that come to teach. So my kids had teachers from New Zealand and kids in their class from Brazil and Australia and just all over the place. But our girlfriend, as a kindergarten teacher on board, um, invited us to just partner with her. And that's how we first heard about Mercy Ships. So when my husband was looking into opportunities after retirement, he said, oh my gosh, Mercy Ships is hiring a chaplain for two years. Do you think we could do this? And I thought, well, I know I could do it, but I don't think my safe conservative first responder husband is going to move his wife and three children to live on a hospital ship in West Africa. But I was wrong. He did. Wow. <laughs> so we just really prayed about it as a family. Our kids were very excited um, and just felt like God was saying, this is, this is what I have for your family. So go do it. And how, how have you been rewarded? Like, tell me some stories that you've seen that you say, wow, this is pretty amazing things you've seen on while you're there on the ship. 
Yeah. Oh my goodness. You know, so, so many amazing things. Um, one of the things that we love to see is our patients transformation. You know, when they walk up the gangway, oftentimes they're very inward. Um, they're scared, rightfully so. And we see them totally transformed through their surgeries and the love and care they receive on board. And when they walk down the gangway to leave, they're completely different people. But I have to say, it's not just our patients' lives that are totally transformed. Anyone who sets foot on one of our vessels, their lives are never the same again. And that was definitely true for my family. My son was 10 years old when we got on board. My twin daughters were 13. And those kids are forever changed, just like my husband and I are. Um, on board, we are living in the hospital, um, you know, just a, a deck or two above it. And so we see patients all the time, just in our everyday lives. And the kids in school would go sometimes on their recess break and go down into the hospital and play with kids in the hospital, play with patients, you know? So there was a lot of interaction and it just really impacts you in, in many incredible ways. Um, you know, I'll give you one, one patient story that, I mean, there's, there's just hundreds and hundreds of them, but you know, there was this one gentleman in particular, his name was Moto, and he had kind of this condition. I, I mean, I don't know the proper terminology, but like his jaw was maybe locked from the time he was little. And so he couldn't open his mouth all the way. And also his chin never fully developed, you know, so his profile was very severe and, um, because of that, he was very malnourished. He had a hard time eating. And when he got to us, um, for his surgery, we said, well, first of all, you need to go through a program to gain proper weight so that, you know, your surgery will be safe. So we've got, you know, nutritionalists on board and stuff and, wow. um, that work with him. And he was, I'm going to say roughly, you know, I would, I would give him about 17, 18 years old. And he just was very, very, very thin but the biggest personality. I mean, this guy, as much as he couldn't really open his mouth, his whole face lit up. You could tell he was just smiling and beaming and he danced all the time. And so the nurses thought he was a riot. He was just a ton of fun to hang out with. It was always brought the party wherever he was. And so this young man, um, he spent, gosh, I want to say at least four or more months, um, not living on board, but living in our, um, off, off ship facility called the hope center. Kind of like, I liken it a little bit to a Ronald McDonald house. Mm -hmm. Our patients will hang out there before surgery and then sometimes post-op. And he was there just bulking up really, you know, like we had him on a feeding program and, you know, a diet and, um, getting, gaining weight. It literally was, you know, a week before his surgery when COVID hit and we had to shut down our operations and everybody mm -hmm was just devastated. I mean, there was about 50 or so patients that we had to go who were waiting at the Hope Center for their surgeries that we had to go and say, I'm so sorry, but we have to leave. And we, we promised this to you and now we can't make good on our promise. And a little side story, what shocked me so much is I remember as a crew, just praying for our nurses that had to go and tell these patients, I'm sorry, we're leaving. Um, but what shocked me was the stories they shared when they came back. And they said, every single one of those patients said, thank you. Thank you for keeping us safe. Thank you for protecting us. And thank you for caring for us while we were here. And I just thought, my gosh, in America, if you were promised a surgery date and all of a sudden your surgeon calls and says, hey, sorry, you know, like I'm closing my practice. I'm not going to do this. And I don't know if you'll ever get surgery again. We would go nuts, right? I mean, yeah, there would it be is. lawsuits, lawsuits, and it would just be terrible. But these Gosh. people were so gracious and just said thank you. And we told them, and Moto, we said we will be back. We don't know when, but we will be back. And two years later, last year, 2023, in February, we returned to Senegal, and Moto had his surgery, and it was like the greatest celebration because so many nurses were able to return. They had remembered him wow. and just the life of the party he was, but didn't lose hope. And we were so grateful that we got to make a good on our promises for all these patients who had to be delayed for like two years. Um, but this young man was just extraordinary. And it's so special to see people have um, just joy, even in the midst of their circumstance. And then how much more once they're set free from their physical, you know, limitations and burdens. So, um, he, he was someone that really impressed my heart. 
Yeah, that's so amazing. I mean, those like what you're saying, it just it makes me laugh because when I was in Guatemala, this I was there and it was the end of clinic. It was like we had a lot we had a lot of people come in. It was probably eight thirty at night and I've been working since, you know, eight in the morning or something like yeah. that. And so the, they go, Brian, we have one more patient for you. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> that time I'm just like done, right? Yeah, yeah. Mentally exhausted. And this lady came in and I said, oh, and she goes, oh, doctor. She grabs my hand. Thank you for waiting for me. Thank you for staying. And I'm like, oh, no problem. How are you? And I said, when did you get here? She said, 4.30 this morning. Oh, she was waiting since 4.30 in the morning. I, said, yeah. I started laughing because it was like, if I'm 10 minutes late at my patient in the United States, they'll be screaming at me and you're thanking yeah. me and hugging me, right? It's yes. a totally different mindset. That is, yes. that's why, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, being in the system for so long and, and 18 years of standard practice, my wife would tell me, because every day I came home from work, I was beat up because I was working 16 hour days here in San oh, Diego. My gosh. Wow. And, um, she said, how come when you go on your medical mission trips, you you work twice as hard, like you're working 18 hour days and you come home and you tell me stories for days and you can't, you're like on fire and like, yeah. I like, yeah, you're right. It's because you're not encumbered by the system. You're helping people. Yeah. And that appreciation, that appreciation. I know exactly what you're saying. And it's so great for, your, you know, my kids have all gone down with me and they, they, they have a different perspective than most kids their age, because mm -hmm. when you see it's, it's not just a, a taken for granted that you're going to have all these things, you know, just going down there and taking a soccer ball for these kids. It's like, they just won the lottery or give yeah. them, you know, whatever little stuff is so important. And then, yeah. you know, our kids, <laughs> They don't appreciate it as much, but I think right. once you go down and you see that and you realize like this guy waiting to get surgery this long and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and being appreciative and finally getting it done. So, so yeah. how did it change? Like, it, did it make a big difference in his life getting the, the job oh, done? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, he had freedom to speak clearly, you know, to open his mouth. Um, I think they actually did a titanium, you know, jaw for him and kind of like reconstructed um, you know, even just the plastic surgery to reconstruct his chin and so forth. But absolutely. I mean, you know, to have that freedom then to eat and he was already a personality in his community, but you deal with, as we mentioned, you know, the curse, the, the mocking, the belittling and all that kind of stuff to just be set free from all that is amazing. You and know, just to be able to communicate your needs, be able to talk and, and smile and laugh and, you know, all these kind of things that we just take for granted. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. That's so amazing. It's amazing that, that you could get down there and, you know, help people. And, you know, these people would never in, in their system, there's no way they would ever get, or it would be 20 years down the road that they can get in to see a doc. Yeah. I and mean, it's, it just, it's just, uh, one of those things you just can't imagine how, no, no, how and important especially it in is. The, yeah. Yeah. And especially in the West, we can't wrap our head around just the numbers, you know, how many people per doctor there are in some of these nations, you know, there might be 50,000 people for one physician and that physician isn't even a surgeon. So they're not going to be able to help maybe your specific need, or, you know, it's just, we don't understand that kind of need where we live. You know, you mentioned San Diego, I'm in Northern California. Like we just don't see that kind of stuff. I mean, we complain now that there's a shortage in the medical field, you know, and I'm like, I have to wait three months to get into a dermatologist. This is ridiculous, you know, and in the, in the developing world, the way most people live in the world, that's, that's not even the case. You know, they just don't have the access to, to medical care that we have here. Yeah, that's right. They just can't even get access. They're just, uh, yeah, you're kind of stuck out there. And, and that's why, you know, I went to Vietnam on my first medical trip and I was asking the doctor, I said, man, these guys, it took me six hours to go through little boats and all this to get to this little remote village. I said, Hey, what happens if someone gets appendicitis? He said, they die. Yeah. I was like, they die. You're not going to make it. Yeah. I was like, Oh my gosh. Like that's right. like, you don't that I was thinking about like, med you can't medevac. What are you going to do? You're, you're stuck. Yeah. So having you come out and be able to do these kind of, kind of, uh, you know, surgeries for people to help them. And, you know, it's amazing. And so some people, they're there like the whole time on the ship, like the ship will go down there for 10 months mm -hmm. docked, and you come home for two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. You just mentioned the appendicitis thing. We actually had a crew member in Madagascar last year who got appendicitis and we couldn't do her surgery on board the ship because actually our hospital, we had just got to Madagascar and it takes us, you know, at least a month or so to set up everything before yeah. we open the hospital. The hospital was not yet open. We didn't have surgeons on board. And so she was medevaced out to South Africa and, you know, was and received surgery there. But, you know, even things like that, 
it sounds so extravagant to get on an aircraft, you know, where you have nurses with you and, you know, medical equipment and, you know, all that kind of stuff that we're afforded because of where we were born, you know, and then some of these other people, like you said, what, what happens when they get appendicitis? Well, they just die, you know? Yeah. Just how it is. I mean, it's amazing. And, and mm -hmm. I remember the other thing that impacted me when I was in Vietnam was I was talking to one of the docs and I said, how do they, like these, some of these people had pacemakers. I go, how they get it? They said, well, some, if someone in Germany dies, they take the pacemaker, clean it up and ship it to vietnam <laughs> and then they they get that pacemaker and you go wow, wow that would yeah. not fly in the united states at all <laughs> no. but that's all they got what are you gonna do you have exactly no, you know, they're not funding for all that kind of stuff right so it's just exactly. amazing how i think in america we take it for granted for sure our medical system i mean we can do heroic things but yeah. hopefully we get more focused on preventive preventing things from happening in the first place so we don't have to be heroic sure sure and you yeah. know what you come back with a real different perspective i know you know just visiting um doctors myself and you know all of a sudden i just look at i look at our nurses in america and i just say thank you thank you for what you do like i so appreciate you and they kind of look at me like what I'm like yeah. i i've literally lived with you you know like i lived with our nurses and yeah. spent 24 hours a day with them eating sleeping playing working and i'm like you guys are so special and i just have a different perspective i'm so sorry i'm late you know what it's okay don't worry about it. I'm good. And they look at me like, are you crazy? Everyone else is mad when I'm late. You know, it's like, Hey, I've seen people wait for days, you know, yeah. in lines for days to be seen desperate just for someone to give them a, a word of hope or a packet of vitamins or something. Um, and yeah, you come home with a, a whole different perspective and, and hopefully a lot more gratitude than you had before. Yeah. I think anyone listening if you have a chance, go volunteer one time. Just go one time. Because yes. so many people go, I'll go once and that's it. And then they're like, like you said, they're living there the rest of their life. They're, this is my calling. I have friends who go, look, I want to move. I want to go yeah. there and help people. And when you right. start, when you get a sense of that, because you know, it's hard for us as healers, uh, you know, when you hear bad things like, you know, terrorist attacks or people, you know, shooting up a school and you think, gosh, how can you yeah. be motivated yeah. to hurt and to cause harm and, and pain? And when, when there's so many good people and that's what, has encouraged me through all this. I've always kept that perspective. I know how many good people there are. I've been to some of the worst places and the worst mm. cities in El Salvador with MS-13 running it. And there's so many great people there. And you go, oh my goodness, they're so, so nice and salt of the earth people yeah, yeah. of faith being stuck, you know, in a, in a place that's rough. And and some of them have really changed that community by by caring mm -hmm. and getting out and trying to, you know, do after school programs for the kids and the, the crime rate drops or whatever, yeah. getting a soccer program together. I mean, just being dedicated to, to people and helping them. Yes. It sends such a message. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I talked to so many nurses who have volunteered with us at Mercy Ships and so many of their stories, I'll always ask, like, how did you get here? What caused you to, you know, want to come and volunteer? Because a lot of our nurses will come for a rotation. So they might be there four to six weeks, usually about three months um, or more. But, you know, I would say three months is kind of the norm. And I've talked to so many nurses who say, I was just so burnt out. I was so burnt out, you know, working in the hospital and so frustrated that I don't get to care for patients like I used to, you know, it's more like you need to hurry up. You have this many minutes in a room and then you got to clip on to the next one. And they said, I came on board really almost at the point of wanting to just leave nursing and go into a different field and to actually get to sit on my patient's bed with them and talk to them with a translator or get to play with them or hug the kids or chase them through the halls of the hospital. And, you know, just remember why I was doing this in the first place. It's just life-giving and it gives people this new energy that a lot of our nurses and doctors take back home to their hospitals and, and try to implement, you know, some of the things that they, that they learned and experienced on board of really just getting to love on the people. Yeah, I think that's that's so important. I think that is, you know, physician burnout, physician suicide. I was just reading yesterday, three hundred mm. to four hundred physicians kill themselves a year in the United wow. States alone, so and it's because they're not they're not being fed. They're not getting. It's like you have more yeah. and more patients, you have more demands, you got to fill out more boxes, you got to you're yeah. not going to get paid if you don't do this, and you got you know, and all this kind of and, and and I think that it just is such a burnout. And I watch physicians around me burning out and not caring anymore. And I thought, you know, I don't want to get that way. That's not why no. we went to medicine. Right. And so exactly. now it's like, we're, we're, it's really all about efficiency and getting that patient in and out as quickly as possible. And how many can I see in a day? Right. Mm -hmm. to, well, otherwise mm -hmm. there's going to be a huge wait to see you. 
Yeah. So it's an it's an overwhelming system. So I think anyone, any doctor, nurse, healthcare provider out there, like if you're burned out, go do this. Just yeah. take take a week or two weeks and just go take your vacation. People go, you take your vacation time and go, I get filled so much. I get when I come back, it's like I've been on three vacations. Guys, yeah. feel so good, even <laughs> though I've been working a, a lot of time. Plus, we have down. I mean, I'm sure you guys have some down days where you kind of oh, get to goof yeah. around and oh, do, do other stuff too, right? Oh yeah, the adventures that you get to have. I mean. So, you know, my kids grew up 10 minutes from the beach in Malibu and we were at the beach all the time, but it wasn't until I moved to Senegal, West Africa that I surfed for the first time, you know, <laughs> on our days off, we would go surfing at the beach. We'd go, we did high ropes course through the baobab trees. You go through all the amazing restaurants and markets in the local cities. And it's, it's a total adventure to get to explore on your days off. Not to mention the fact that living on board you're living in this incredible multicultural community. Because I said our volunteers come from all over the world. At any given time, we might have 50 to 60 different nations represented on board and our crew. And so you get to learn so much about all these other nations living on board with these people. But it's kind of, yes, everyone works very hard, but it's also a little bit like summer camp for adults, in my opinion. <laughs> you know, we've got waffle Fridays where everyone pauses at 10 a.m. to go and have their free waffle. Um, there's ice cream on Thursday nights. There's like karaoke nights and all these fun things. And everybody is all in and participates. So there's a lot of work, but gosh, there is a lot of play and a lot of adventure. Yeah, I can only imagine because I know I go on these short term mission trips and I'll be, you know, there 10 days, 15, but the people you're there with, you grow so close and you get to know each other yeah. in such a short time because it's such an intense mm -hmm. uh, experience. And I think the other thing that, that we kind of alluded to, like you're saying, like, I don't have medical experience. I've had so many people go on these medical trips with me that they said, I'm going to, I'm like a waste of, a waste of space. What am I going to do? I have nothing. I don't even know the language. And they get used powerfully there. And you <laughs> like one of the one of the guys says, you know, I don't have any medical training. We can help you. To, like he was on the building team actually helping us build some stuff and you know, help people with handicap ramps and things like that. Yeah. And he had lost his son to to uh drug overdose. Mm -hmm. And one of the ladies there lost her son to drug overdose and she said, No one understands how I feel. And he said, I do. And he wow. spent, you know, forty five minutes and, and it was an amazing, powerful experience for her, mm -hmm. life changing for her. Yeah. And then afterwards, I was teased when I said, yeah, I don't think you're going to be useful at all on this trip <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah. after this huge, powerful. So, yeah, I think it's it's so important. Everyone thinks they don't have anything to offer. But, you know, like yeah. they say, uh, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. Right. Absolutely. So you get there and and there's things you can do and help out. And even if you're whatever it is, I've seen such mm -hmm. amazing, amazing uh, impacts of people who have no medical experience at all. Yeah. And, and you know what? Even some of our medical professionals working outside of their realm, you know, like I had one nurse on board and she was a labor and delivery nurse. Well, we don't do labor and delivery on our ships. And so she kind of thought like, well, how am I going to be used here? She was also a lactation consultant. Well, all of our patients that come on board, if they're children, they have to come with a caregiver and whether that's a parent or a grandparent or neighbor or something. And so we will get, you know, a, maybe a five-year-old coming on board to have, um, uh, uh, excuse me, orthopedic surgery and their mom will come with them, but their mom just had a baby. And so we had this newborn on board the ship because the mom had to bring the newborn because she was nursing the baby, but struggling to nurse the baby. And all of a sudden this nurse who was, you know, working on the ward walks over and she got to totally use her skills and her mm -hmm. expertise to help this mom, even though that's not technically something we do on board, but God just does such amazing things. He, in his economy, nothing is wasted. So people might say like, oh, I only do peds, you know? So if you're just doing adults, I can't come and serve. And it's like, well, you know what? You have something to offer. And maybe God wants to just bless you in a way that you didn't even imagine. Yeah. I mean, that's. That's why, because I'm adult medicine over there, I do peds because I'm, you know, there's a need and the kids are there. And so I have to learn all my peds again. And we have a couple of pediatricians I work with. And so they run like with adults, they're like, what do I do with this one? Send them to Brian, you know? So yeah. it's so cool, though, that you can learn and you can, you, you know, you can really help these kids. Like simple things yeah. like treating parasite infections. You know, I, I have a kid, I have a picture on my wall of this one kid. He was scrawny and like, you know, mm you know, uh, had eczema all over his body. And I was thinking, how can he be out in the middle of the jungle and have all this stuff? I mean, he's not exposed to chemicals and maybe it's the cooking inside, like you said. Yeah. And, uh, a year later I see him and he's healthy. He's gained 20 pounds. He's fit, muscular. He's the head of the soccer team and he was wheezing and he was really not very healthy before. 
And so I asked the Guatemalan doctor, I said, why is he so, look how great he looks. Like, remember him from last time? Yeah, I remember. And he said, you treat him for parasites. The parasites go away. They can gain weight. They get their, their, their wow. asthma gets better. Their eczema gets better. All these things get better. Just that one pill. I go, one pill? He goes, last a year. I was like, wow. wow, that's pretty amazing. So things like that, that we just don't, like one pill could make yeah. a huge difference, you know, in, in these kids' lives. Oh, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> and so are you, so you're pretty much full time. So you go 10 months, you come home for a couple of months and go back again. So it just depends for our, um, you know, what positions people have on board, how long they commit to, but our ships, yes, are usually in port for 10 months. And then the ship will pull out, go to, um, Tenerife and the Canary Islands to have some refurbishment, some maintenance done on the vessel and then sail back to a different country. Sometimes we go back to the same country. For example, um, the Global Mercy just a couple of weeks ago pulled back into Sierra Leone um, and we were just in Sierra Leone, left for two months and came right back, which is awesome because we built these relationships with the government, with the Ministry of Health, wow. and we've already established um, you know, kind of the relationships and the protocols and stuff. So it's easy to, to go right back into these countries. But yeah, a lot of our crew too, they don't sail with us. People think we're ships, we're sailing all over the place. A lot of our crew will fly in and out of the, mm -hmm. you know, the port city to get on board. And then some of us do have the, the fun adventure of sailing. Um, my family did when we got on board in, in Tenerife and actually Gran Canaria. And then we sailed down to Senegal. It was about a four day sail. And that was amazing. That was magical for sure. I was a little bit scared. I thought, I don't know. I've never been on a cruise before. I don't know what it's going to be like to be in the open ocean. Am I going to want to get out of this thing? Yeah, um, but it was all right. Oh my gosh. It was amazing. And the dolphins and the flying fish and the oh turtles and, and the stars at night. The stars and all that at night. Yeah, it's surreal, amazing. you know? Yeah. It was, it was incredible. Uh, that's so amazing. So, so do you know anything about the history? Like how did this start? Like how long, how long have the mercy ships, how many mercy ships are there? Yeah. So we've been around for about 45 years. Oh, wow. And in that time we've performed over upwards of like 120,000 surgeries and not to mention all of the dental procedures and all the training and advocacy. I mean, there's the numbers are, are huge of the, of the impact that has happened over the past 45 years, but it really started with our founder, Don Stevens. He was a young boy in rural Colorado, landlocked state, no ships, but God gave him a vision for hospital wow. ships. And because really 50% of the world, um, the world's population is located near a coastline. And so if we can take ships to get to them, you know, you can take care of a lot of people in that time. So anyways, God gave him a vision as a young boy. And then he just carried on with that until he bought his first ship. Um, and I believe in Greece, I mean, obviously there were lots of partners involved and a lot of people that came alongside him, but yeah. you know, just incredible how God can use young people to do incredible things. And that's, that's something that mercy ships really values on board our ships. When we have families that come, the kids are considered crew. They're not, oh, the kids of the crew. It's like, no, they are crew. They have responsibilities on board. My kids went down and helped count pills in the pharmacy. You know, they'll clean tables in the dining room. Um, you know, the kids are totally involved. Like I mentioned, they play with patients and get to do visits and stuff. Um, but, you know, similarly, God called Don Stevens when, when he was a young man and had him birth this incredible organization that's really changing lives. That's amazing. And then once one person has that vision, they they get other people involved because obviously it had to be a ton of investment to get yeah. operating rooms and do it. And yep. it's a new idea. Right. <laughs> absolutely. Have operating rooms on a ship that you could just bring people on and off to have that vision is pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. And to have the partners that we have and the generous donors has just been incredible. I mean, we are volunteer based, as I said. And so we really run off of the donations of others. And we have some corporate, you know, partners that as well that supply, you know, the lenses when we do cataract surgeries, those are all donated and, you know, various people. But when we built our second vessel, um, the Global Mercy, it was built from the ground up, the first ever like purpose-built hospital ship for Mercy Ships. And before that ship sailed out of the port in China, it was completely paid off, which is absolutely unheard of. But it was just... Wow the extravagant, generous 
people who gave and just said, I want to invest in God's work. I want to invest in the kingdom and eternal things that are going to change lives forever. And so, um, it's, that's another huge, you know, impact for us is to see people just not only give their lives away, but give their resources away in such incredible ways. Yeah, that's amazing. And and I would think a lot of uh, funding comes from churches and church groups and you know, all that, uh, you know, that. And, and so I would think yeah. there's probably churches who send teams out with you all the time. You know what? We haven't actually done things like that. Really? Which, yeah. And I, it's something I've actually thought about a lot is what would it look like to get church groups to come? But I think because there's so many things you have to go through to live. It's one thing to, you know, travel to a foreign country, right? Uh, a developing nation, you got to get vaccines and so forth. But then to be living in a hospital environment It's kind of like a whole nother level of screening, you know, that you have Mm -hmm. to go through. It is an intense environment. You got to be able to walk a lot of stairs up and down, you know, all the decks all the time. Um, So, you know, just bringing people on for a week here or there is not not something we've been able to do. However, you know, some of our donors, um, they will come on a vision trip and get to be on board for about four days and get to see firsthand, you know, take a tour of the hospital. Some of Mm -hmm. them can even watch in, not in the actual theater, but, you know, can watch in on a screen, some of the operations and stuff. So some of our donors, you know, I guess if you have excessive resources and want (laughs) to give, we might be able to bring you on board for a couple of days to check it out. Yeah. I think that's a, you know, that's something that's important. I think more people should do that. Charities you give and you go, you know, if 80% of it's going to advertising and and it's not really going into helping people, people don't realize that, you know, one of the foundations I work with, like I, I look at their books, I see what they're doing like 96% is going towards the patients and, and yeah. helping people. And you go, wow, that's pretty amazing. And a little bit is over overhead just for like minimal stuff you need. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's pretty amazing when, when you see, it. and I think it's anyone who, who donates, you should go see what the people are doing with the money. Right. Yeah. I think it's really important for you to firsthand when you see it, you say, okay, this is mm-hmm. definitely worth it. You know, yeah. to see what, you know, people going down there. And, and again, like, just like when I do my trips, we pay to go down, to do sure. this way like, it's not free they don't pay us to go down there right. and so it's, it's such a hard concept for people like you're paying to go help people <laughs> right <laughs> like your friends will say that's why yeah oh because yeah the rewards are so much way more than what you're paying to go down there 100 percent, 100 percent. and, and we you see the meds and you see people getting you know treatments that they wouldn't be able to get and you see these life-changing surgeries pretty it's, it's pretty amazing it's just oh, yeah. amazing oh yeah for sure what you get is far greater than what you give so you think it's better than watching TV all the time when you retire? Kinda. <laughs> yeah, kinda, right? Yeah, you know, we get we get a lot of people on board. We get the spectrum. You know, we get kids who um, have just graduated from high school. They don't know what they want to do with their lives. They take a gap year. It's like if you're 18, come on board. We had a guy when we were on board. He flew over to Dakar on his 18th birthday, and he served as a receptionist. And he was there for three months, but then like many people, that three months became six months and the six months became, you know, the year. And then he went home to go to medical school. You know, he's like, I want to be a doctor. And so he's finishing up medical school, actually, I think within the next year or two. But, um, you know, we get, yeah, we get the 18 year olds, but then we get people who are retired. You know, we've got a couple on board right now who are retired educators and professors. And they just said, I don't want to sit around and play golf. You know, like that's not who I am. What can I do? Mm -hmm. And so they've actually been on board now. I want to say three years, maybe they're going into their fourth commitment and they are just loving it. Their daughter actually was the teacher that we supported years ago. Um, She's on board still serving. I think this is her eighth year. And so now her parents are on board serving with her. Um, She recently got married to a man that was, um, that she met on board. That's another, another incentive. You know, if any of you single physicians out there, (laughs) a lot of, we call it the love boat for a reason. You know, a lot of people meet their spouse on board, but. um, Yeah, because you find people who are, they're looking to help people. They're in it for the right reason like yeah, people like who aren't there for the right reason aren't going to go do this exactly exactly so yeah you get a lot of people from you know the 18 years old to being in retirement age and it's just this beautiful community on board all coming together for one purpose and you do you get medical residents and and uh fellows and stuff like that coming out too so not really um for the most part our 
medical professionals on board, they have to have experience. Like our nurses have to have two years in the field um, after their degree before they're eligible to come on board and serve. So any of the, you know, um, maybe less experienced people that come on board are usually, like I mentioned, are local um, doctors or nurses or, you know, medical people in the developing nation where we serve, we will bring them on board to mentor them and, and to instruct them. But, um, our, our professionals that come to volunteer, they have to have experience. Yeah. They're pretty seasoned. Yeah. I didn't know. Cause I, I was just wondering if they do it like for training purposes and learning and, and all that kind of stuff, but teaching people from the country is way more important, right? Because yeah. Yeah. We can get that training anywhere in the United States, but exactly. you'll see things there that you'll never see anywhere else. And you think, wow, I've seen stuff and go, oh my goodness, I'll never see that again. You know, yeah. just amazing. You, yeah. you learn a lot. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the aspect of having, you know, doctors and nurses from all over the world on board, even if you are a seasoned physician or nurse, you come on board and there's a huge learning curve because you're now working alongside someone from Ireland and someone from Switzerland, and they have a different vocabulary with instruments and, and the way they do things. And so, you know, no matter what, you're going to learn a lot when you come on board, whether you've been doing this for decades or it's only been a couple of years, you're going to learn a lot, especially from the international community around you. Yeah. And culturally you learn, like, how do you do yeah. it in your culture? And, and it's amazing. Yeah. Like I've, I've taken we were just down in Guatemala and we took a team of builders and the Guatemalans are looking at these guys and so you don't have to do it this way. Here's how we do it. And they, you know, they, it was funny at first they're like, I don't know if that's going to work. They go, trust us. It works. And then yeah. and they're like, Oh my gosh. So they, <laughs> it's amazing. They learn from each other yeah. and they say, you don't need all these fancy tools. You just need this. And, but certain tools they brought down, they're like, this is amazing. This helps us a lot. Sure. So just that they, but these guys bonded like no other. These guys were crying. These big macho guys were crying when they had to leave because they, they were so connected by working. Yeah you know, accomplishing mm -hmm. something together and learning from each other and having fun and laughing. And, you know, even if they didn't know the language, great, they, they, they connected, you know? Oh, for sure. For sure. And we find that on board too. I mean, the community, it becomes your family so quickly. And then you have friends to visit all over the world, you know, because we say once a mercy shipper, always a mercy shipper. You are part of the family once you come on board and you have those relationships for life. Yeah. It's amazing melting pot of getting, you know, mm -hmm. everyone together and, yeah, it's a, it, it has to be something. Yeah. You know? So I have to ask you, what's life's best medicine for you after going through all this? You've been doing this since 19, right? 2019 is when you went full time. Yeah. Much. Yeah. Oh, gosh. gosh you know, right before the pandemic stuff. Holy cow. That changed stuff a lot. Yeah. That changed stuff quite a bit. That was that was a whole nother adventure. Um, life's best medicine. My goodness. You know what I've always said? is if you can get to an ocean, you're going to be okay. I think there's healing power in the ocean air. But I also, you know, from the time I was, I went to Pepperdine University, right on the ocean in Malibu. Mm -hmm. And from that time, really, um, I just kind of joked that Jesus lives at Westward Beach in Malibu. So if ever you need to hang out with the Lord, you know, get yourself to Malibu and you're going to be just fine, you know, but you know, I just, life's best medicine is to be outside in God's creation, you know, whether it's the ocean or the mountains or a lake, or even just a path in your backyard, um, to just be outside, to see something that God has created to bring glory to himself, but also to bring pleasure to us, to just be in awe and wonder of a sunset or a sunrise, to know that the creator of the universe makes these beautiful things just to tell us that he loves us and he wants us to enjoy this life that he's given us when things are really hard. If I can just get outside and get to the ocean and watch the waves that never, ever mm -hmm. stop crashing, no matter what, they will never stop. It just reminds me of God's love for me, that it never, ever stops. Whether I'm having a good day or I'm having a bad day, I am still made in the image of God and I am his child, no matter what. And just like those waves continue to crash, his love will continue to come for me always. So life's best medicine, get outside, be in awe of God's creation. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's so important. And then you get vitamin D, you get all these things and, you know, being mm -hmm. out just grounding. There's more and more data coming out on all these things that we thought were so silly. You say, well, there, there's definitely a benefit. I know I feel it. Yeah, if I'm absolutely. not in nature for a while, when I get out there, it's like, oh, I can breathe. I can relax. And the world goes on, you know, uh, one of the docs I talked to who was locked up during COVID stuff. And mm. he said, when he went outside, he saw the birds flying and, and nature's still going. 
Yeah. Despite yeah. us being stressed and tense and worried, you know, right. you know, there's still life going on, isn't there? Yeah. It doesn't but, stop, you know? So. Yeah. And I think gratitude, like you're talking about helping people, you know, you know all these things are so important. Yeah. So give your it, life away, you know, give your life away. I mean, there's no point in, in amassing it. You know, I, I, uh, I recently, unfortunately lost my father and, at his memorial service, some of the testimonies that were shared were stories that I had never, ever heard of before, but about, I knew my father was generous, but to hear people tell stories about the, how my dad gave to them, whether it was his time or his resources or whatever, I just thought, you know what, that's a life well lived, a life that when you take your final breath, you aren't holding it all, but you have given it all away. And so whether that's to get on board with Mercy Ships or that's to love on your neighbor that lives across the street or whatever it might be, just give your life away. Yeah, they, that's so important. And that was, you know, a friend of mine's a pastor said that he said one day we were sitting there and he said, Brian, you know what? It's all about the potato salad. And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> what are you talking about? He said, well, I've done a lot of celebrations of life when someone dies, you know, you go and do this, you know, the burial or whatever. Then you go back to Aunt Betty's house or some family member's house. She said, he said, I don't know why, but they always have potato salad for some reason, these things. <laughs> and he said, people are going to sit around and eat their potato salad and talk about your life. They're going to yeah. say, what a waste. Like he, he had so much potential, never did. Or they're going to say, like your dad, he helped me this day. He did these things. He, you know, he, he, he was giving and he gave of his time. He gave of his, you know, and not. They don't say like, oh, he had a really nice car or he worked more than anyone, you know, I yeah. mean, these things that we think are so valuable, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just shifting sands, you're ch just chasing the wind, you know, yeah, for so sure. to be able to live life and go and help people and dedicate yourself to doing something like that, where you're seeing positive, uh, mm -hmm. and you're, in your case, it's fun because it's not like you're planting seeds and waiting for it to grow. You, you go there and you see, you see the fruit right away. You know, yeah. the people can be rewarded by seeing a, a, a major surgery help someone or, you know, just giving someone a pair of glasses and they can see again, like it, it could be so simple. Right. And, you know, I always think about that 99 cent glasses I've seen change people's lives. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you a story because you'll appreciate it is I was in uh, Guatemala and, and a kid came in and, you know, the mom, we saw the mom first and, and the aunt and they were saying, yeah, this kid, he's, he's just not smart. He's not doing well in school. And, mm -hmm. you know, so we said, well, we'll talk to him. We'll try to get him back in shape, you know? And so he came in and we started talking to him and we said, so why don't you study? Why? He said, when I look, I get a headache and everything's blurry. Mm -hmm. At first I can see it, then it gets, you know, and so we said, you know what, let's try to class. And we had pictures of him because it was so silly, but you know, this little pair of glasses, he goes, no, put on another. He's like, and then that kid wow. sat there and read Bible stories to the rest of the kids all day long. Oh my right? goodness. He just couldn't see. And he just like, couldn't okay. see. Yeah. Wow. And so things like that, little things you go, wow, we will always write. Even when I see him now, I rem he goes, remember that kid? It was amazing. And yeah. then the other thing that was funny is he, he has another kid. The kid says, yeah, I was somewhere and I got bit by a dog. Oh. And he said, where'd you get bit? Or, 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 like he was asking where on your body did you, did it bite you? And he said, yeah. at my house, of course. <laughs> like okay and we start laughing because it's, oh it's just gosh. so it's so great i mean the the cultures the the you know the people are so nice and like you said it's so appreciative so yeah. if people want to join you how do they track you down yeah you know the best way is to get on mercyships.org um, specifically, mercyships.org slash serve is where you can find all of the opportunities to come on board like i said even if you are a physician and you want a break Come serve in the galley, you know, like come serve in housekeeping or something and just, you know, kind of recharge yourself and get your fuel back. But um, the website is a great place to find out how you can give to Mercy Ships, how you can come and serve with us or just pray for us, pray for our patients, pray for our crew, the nations where we serve, you know, just pray for them. Um, another little, a little thing I always like to throw out is get on YouTube and type in Mercy Ships. There are so many videos that we've produced, you know, of patient stories from beginning to end that are incredible. Some of them are just five minutes long. Grab a box of Kleenex. It'll, you know, just level you. But also a lot of our crew upload videos um, of their time on board to really give you a picture of what life is like um, living on a hospital ship. And you can just go down that rabbit hole for hours watching amazing videos. Yeah, awesome. That That's so amazing to see these. And not only that, it's so uplifting just to see it. There's healing in that, just seeing someone get healed, to see, yes. see these, you know, these testimonies and stories and all that. Because, you know, it's funny. A part of the reason I, I started this podcast is I have another one called uh, Low Carb MD and it has like 30 million downloads or something. But if I start talking about faith and, 
laying in the sun or relaxing, people say, we just want to hear about diet. We don't want to hear about this other stuff, but <laughs> all these things are play a huge role. Oh, and yeah. so a couple of people say, well, if you're a doctor, how could you have faith? Because, you know, that's all like hocus pocus stuff. You're supposed to be smart and intellectual. I'm like, well, there is some intellectual uh, to this. There's certain things in life that you see. So yeah. I said, okay, I'll bring people on and share their testimony, their story. You argue with me and tell me like when someone's life's changed that they used to be the head of MS-13. One of the guys I see it in, uh, in Guatemala, <laughs> he got saved. Now he's a clown. He goes out and helps people, kids around the world. He goes, he's one of the, and he has scars all over his body from getting shot and stabbed wow. and all this stuff. And he's one of the nicest guys on earth, but you realize like something happened. <laughs> like, that's yeah. not natural for you to go from being, you know, a, a, the head of MS-13 to like, serving your community and helping build walls and hospitals and things like that, you know, because right, right. I think at some point you realize what matters and, and what you're doing matters. And, and it, it's, it's eternal of helping people and, yeah. and, you know, changing generations to come by being kind and, you know, getting, getting people down there. So Rayanne, thank you so much for joining me. So awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks we'll for having sure me. Sure. We have a, all the, the, um, contact stuff in the show notes. So anyone take a second, look at the show notes and we'll, we'll uh, get you connected if you're, you know, and even if it's like, I don't know if you guys do like $3 a month or something, if that works, if people who say that's all I got, yeah, skip absolutely. your Starbucks for a day or two, you know, and, and, and help out. That'd be great. Yep. We would love it. So awesome. So everyone listening, this is like, there's a lot of wisdom here, a lot of great, great stuff. And I hope you're inspired to, you know, even if you serve in your community, do something, just give of yourself somewhere, just do something that's outside your comfort zone. And, and, you know, maybe go to a different country, go somewhere and, and just see what happens. And, and it's amazing. You'll be used. It's pretty amazing. So mm -hmm. be kind to yourself, be kind to others and think about volunteering, getting out, helping out or helping others send other people to go do it. You know, you don't have to go if you don't want to, but uh, a lot of people have helped me along the way. And and so it's, it's a great thing to do. So if you hear someone who's volunteering, going to do it, say, Hey, I'll give you 20 bucks or a hundred bucks or whatever it is. And it, it will be, you know, well, well spent way better than anything else you could spend it on. So Rayanne, thank you so much. Safe travels to you, safe sailing. And who knows one of these days. Yep. We'd love one to have you days. on board. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Blessings. Thanks, Brian. Thank you for listening to this episode. We greatly appreciate your support. We would greatly appreciate a positive thumbs up on all of the platforms like uh, iTunes and uh, Spotify or wherever you're listening. And we just thank you for our Patreon supporters. Uh, we greatly appreciate that you're helping getting this message out. We think there's a lot of important information. And uh, hopefully this helps you. You know, Have a great day and thank you for listening and thank you for your support. Mm -hmm.